gentlemen. Welcome to today's video. Today we will be talking about the sinking of the RMS Titanic, which sank on April 15, 1912, at 2.20 a.m., with a loss of 1,500 souls. But first, we must go back to the year 1869. The company, the White Star Line, is going bankrupt. And a man named Thomas Henry Ismay purchases the company for only 1,000 pounds. Now, let's go to some ship evolution history. The first ship the White Star Line built was the RMS Oceanic. It was completed in 1871, weighed 3,707 gross register tons, was 420 feet long, and could go to speeds up to 14.5 knots. 18 years later, a ship named the RMS Teutonic was completed. This ship was completed in 1889, weighed 9,984 gross register tons, was 582 feet long, and could go to speeds up to 20.5 knots. Finally, a ship named the RMS Adriatic was completed. This ship was completed in 1907, weighed 24,679 gross register tons, was 729 feet long, and could go up to speeds of 18 knots. Now you guys might be asking, what's the point? Why am I saying this? Well, the reason is that before airplanes became the common use of transportation, ships were the main transportation across the seas. Now you might be saying, but Random Studios, the airplane was invented in 1903, and the Titanic sank in 1912. While yes, technically true, you have to remember that planes in the old days were very faulty and had many problems. In fact, the first plane to cross the Atlantic did so in 1919, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyways, back to boats. For the past century, ships continued to get bigger and bigger, as the need for them went up. In only one century, ships evolved from sail, to steam with sail, to completely steam, a enormous feat. To show you how much ships have changed, I will compare the Titanic with the Allure of the Seas, the largest passenger ship in 2012. Titanic was 882 feet long. The allure is 1,187 feet, a 35% increase. Titanic weighed 115,820 gross tons, while the allure weighs 225,282 gross tons, a whopping 95% increase. The Titanic could carry around 3,327 people, while the allure can carry 6,780 people a mind-whopping 103% increase. So, what am I saying here? I'm saying that ships have always been expanding bit by bit, piece by piece, and that is where the story of Titanic begins. As mentioned previously before, the White Star Line was purchased by a man named Thomas Henry Ismay. Now that Ismay had bought the company, he had one problem. He had little funding to build any ships. Luckily, he was playing billiards with a man named Gustav Schwab one night in 1869. Gustav offered to finance Ismay's company if Ismay agreed to have all his ships built at Schwab's nephew's company, Harland and Wolf. Fun fact, Harland and Wolf was founded on April 11, 1861, which was one day before our American brothers started their civil war. Kind of suspicious if you ask me. Ismay agreed, and from that point on until the end of the White Star Line itself, all of the ships for the line were built at Harland and Wolf. The White Star Line did well for the 19th century except for the sinking of the SS Atlantic in 1873. I know this isn't Titanic related, but I'm going to give you a brief summary of the disaster. The SS Atlantic had successfully completed 18 voyages. On the 19th voyage, however, that would change. The ship encountered a storm out at sea, and the captain was worried the ship would run out of coal. The ship did have sails, but the wind was blowing in the wrong direction. The chief engineer took the amount of coal and subtracted a amount, 
to not make the captain reliant on coal, which was standard practice at the time. And after hearing that the ship would not have enough coal to reach New York, decided to divert to Halifax to refuel. The officers kept a lookout for a lighthouse that was on shore, and when they saw it, they would anchor for the night. However, the strong currents of the Halifax region pushed the ship far away from the lighthouse, making the officers looking in the wrong direction. Only one man, the quartermaster, knew Halifax waters and was worried, but the officers dismissed his warnings. Then, at 3.15 a.m. on April 1, 1873, the Atlantic ran aground off the coast of Nova Scotia. The sudden stop of the Atlantic made the oil lamps, which were the main source of electricity at the time, snuffed out. The Atlantic was now plunged into darkness. The waves around the ship made the lowering of lifeboats impossible, so a rope was connected to a rock on the shore and that's how people got off the ship. Locals also helped in the evacuation. Out of the roughly 952 people on board, only 429 survived. Sadly, because of placement regions within the ship, not a single woman survived, and only one child survived. What do you mean placement regions you ask? Well back in the day, the steerage passengers were separated by gender, and this was to prevent harassment. The single women and children, usually going to meet their husbands, were in the stern. The families were in the middle section. And the single men, most likely going to find jobs before the wife came over, were in the bow. Now you see, the ship sank by the stern pretty quickly, so unfortunately, few women got out, and those that did were killed by the huge waves. This ship was the worst sinking on the Atlantic until the 1898 sinking of the La Bourgogne, and the worst White Star Line disaster until the Titanic. Now let's continue. The White Star Line continued to do well for the remainder of the 19th century. Near the end of the 1800s, Thomas Ismay noticed something. Before the previously mentioned Teutonic, the White Star Line competed heavily for the Blue Riband. The Blue Riband was an unofficial prize given to steamships with the fastest crossing across the Atlantic. However, the speed industry was costly. The White Star Line realized that it was super expensive, and the Blue Ribbon Prize was usually held for only a few years. So, Ismay decided to focus more on luxury than speed, and the profits would be enormous. This turned out to be a smart decision. Then in 1898, something creepy happened. A man, Morgan Robertson, published a book, Futility, or The Wreck of the Titan. After Titanic's sinking, many parallels were found between the fake Titan and the real Titanic. One, the Titan was the largest ship of its time, being called unsinkable. Titanic was the largest ship in the world, and was called by some to be nearly unsinkable. Two, both ships could carry 3,000 people. Furthermore, both ships did not have enough lifeboats for their passengers. Three, both ships struck an iceberg at near full speed 400 miles off Newfoundland in April. Four, the name, Titan and Titanic. However, there are some big differences. One, Titanic struck the iceberg on the starboard side. The Titan ran straight into an ice shelf. 2. Titanic hit the berg in clear visibility. The Titan struck the berg in misty conditions. 3. 700 people on the Titanic survived, while only 13 on the Titan survived. 4. The Titanic sank on its maiden voyage, while the Titan had successfully completed many voyages. 5. Titan had sails, Titanic had none. 6. Titanic was heading to the US, Titan was heading to England. After hearing this, while yes, there were some striking similarities, there is just too much different between these two ships for there actually to be a good comparison. It was merely a coincidence, 
but still a very creepy one. In 1899, Thomas Ismay died, and the company was given to his son, Bruce Ismay. Bruce Ismay continued to expand his father's company. In 1902, the company was bought by the International Mercantile Marine Company, or IMMC, which was a trust intent on buying all of the shipping companies to make one large shipping industry. The owner of this company was American businessman J.P. Morgan. Despite being bought, the White Star Line still had freedom. They were favorited by the IMMC, which allowed White Star Line to get liners from other ship companies, but they continued building their own as well. They built the big four, the Celtic, Cedric, Baltic, and Adriatic, that were very popular for the time. But then, something happened, the White Star Line's main rivals, the Cunard Line, which still exists today by the way, decided to build two new liners that would shun the big four. These two ships were the Mauritania and the Lusitania. These ships were massive. The Lusitania itself was 7,000 more tons and 70 feet longer than the Adriatic. Also, the Lusitania could go 26 knots. They were designed to go 24 though, meaning it could cross the Atlantic in only five days. Now, of course, there were some problems. There was tons of complaints about the Lusitania's and Mauritania's engine noise, which made the ship rattle. The ship's designers put in multiple columns throughout the ship, and this helped out some, but it destroyed the grandeur of the ship. However, the ships were still far superior to the Big Four, and now the White Star Line had to think of something to beat the Cunard Line's new ships. Eventually, the idea came. Bruce Ismay and Lord Peary, the owner of Harland and Wolf, decided to build two new liners, the largest in the world, that would be far superior to the Cunard Line's ships in terms of size and luxury. And so, the plan was put forth into action. Join us next time for the Titanic Construction.